Yeah, so uh, I'm going to be talking about the uh, KZG ceremony or uh, how I learned to stop worrying and love trusted setups. So uh, five months ago, I think I wasn't the only one who uh, stopped using the chain or started using it uh, very sporadically. And uh, the, uh, the demand is just way, way outstrips the supply of block space. And uh, this, is, this is not a, a future we can uh, continue on into for Ethereum. So we need to greatly change how we're doing things to scale our capabilities. The L2s are the promise way of doing this. Um, for your multiple years now, um, we've been hearing about the uh, roll-up centric design and how L2s are going to provide us with uh, what we need. But L2s are only part of um, what's required. Uh, scaling comes in sort of two variants for Ethereum. There is scaling compute. Um, L2s take us from what Ethereum is right now, which is effectively a single-threaded, very slow uh, computer, to a massively multi-threaded, much faster uh, processor. The problem is, is that L2s on their own don't have a way of storing this data. Enter protodunk sharding, also known as EIP4844. Um, the idea behind here is that we enable uh, incredible amounts of data for these L2s to use and just for them, such that they can um, provide, if they're providing the compute, here's the storage to match that and uh, scale Ethereum up to, to, to what we need. So what does this uh, proto-dank sharding look like? We have these notions of blobs. It's some arbitrary data from the protocol's perspective. We don't really care what it is. Um, but to the rollups, it's basically going to be compressed transactions. And then we use this device called the KZG commitment to compress down this data and only store a small reference to it on chain. Um, then once the uh, block proposer has proposed this data, the validators there in the bottom check that this data is available. They check that they have access to it and that the, the network has uh, propagated this. And if so, they uh, vote that they've seen this data, uh, um, and this gets also put on the blockchain. So from the blockchain's perspective, we know that this data was around. There was an opportunity at some point for all the rollups and rollup users to download the data that they care about. The validators then save the data locally to their own disks, um, and uh, this, this, this gets stored. Um, but this has the problem which Ethereum has right now, which is where we're storing incredible amounts of data again. And the idea behind dank sharding is that we're scaling this way beyond Ethereum's current capabilities, which would mean uh, for the people who are already struggling to run their, their nodes, this would be unacceptable. So the final step in this is uh, two weeks later, we throw away the data. So it's not that we promise to keep this data around forever. That's not what proto dank sharding guarantees. Proto-dank sharding guarantees that at some point in the past, this data was available for people to download, and uh, should they have wanted to, done the, to have done this, they could. It is then on the roll-ups, uh, on the users, to store the data they're interested in. So if you're interested in certain transactions, you could store just your transactions. Um, roll-up sequences could store, ev well, we'll be storing everything. Um, but it's just no longer the chain's responsibility to store this. Uh, you can put it, host on IPFS. Um, it doesn't really matter. Just that validators no longer need to store this. So effectively, they have this um, sliding window of the past two weeks of state that they need to look after. Some may ask, why KZG? Um, it's a very full table. I'm not expecting you to take all of it in. Um, the current solution we use for these kinds of commitments on chains are the are Merkle trees. Um, but as you can see, there's lots of red on the Merkle, the, the, the Char, Char Merkle tree column on the left there. Um, what, and what we really care about is this top line, right? If we're trying to enable, um, if we're trying to enable rollups and L2s, lots of them are zk EVMs or zk rollups, and they care about being able to prove the things about this data inside the rollup. And as you can see from this top line, if we stick to our current mechanisms, it's quite literally not possible. 
Um, the only realistic other alternative would be IPAs, but there are several other trade-offs um, that they make. So KZG is a very promising looking thing, but it has this one big red negative as you see over there, and that's this trusted setup. And that's what I'm speaking to you about today. Trusted setups, this I hope should make everyone a little bit nervous. Um, trust is not a thing we try have in the system. There's trust but verify, so ideally you shouldn't need to do this. I'd like to be able to convince you today that uh, in this case, this is something you should be able to uh, trust and that you can verify lots of things about it. So the idea is that collectively, as an Ethereum community, and hopefully including many of those outside of our community, we're going to summon a secret. There's not a single person, entity, doesn't matter what scale, that will be able to know what the secret is, but together we will have generated this. It runs on a so-called one of n trust assumption. The idea here is that we need one person not to have actively been malicious. It's not that we need one person to be good, it's we need one person not to be bad and to actively like pull apart the code and try to figure out how they could corrupt this and that kind of thing. We just need one person not to have done that. Um, so what does this, what does this look like? Um, the ceremony is going to be written by people. People make mistakes, so there will be bugs. This is part of the plan. So we have uh, multiple implementations that people can use. You can write your own implementation. The idea being that even if there is a bug in one of the implementations, uh, there are still a lot, of imp a lot of contributions that people have made via the other implementations that keep us safe. There will be malicious people. Um, in the blockchain setting, it's very adversarial. Um, theoretically, if you could collect all of these secrets that people contributed, it would be worth a lot of money because you could do a lot of bad things. So in some sense, there's some value behind this. Not really, because you really need to get all of them. Having one short is not enough, but there will be some people who will try to be malicious and try spread FUD. So we lose a few more of these contributions. But the idea is, is that there'll still be many contributions which won't have this problem. And by many contributions, I really mean a great scale. Like that's not even close, not even. This is my sort of low bound goal for the number of people I'd like to contribute. This is 8,192 contributions. Um, this graph is something I personally care about, it's a bit silly, but uh, hopefully this ceremony we're running will be the first ceremony ever where there are more participants than we have powers. Um, so normally you have these very big hard to run ceremonies and one or two people contributing. Here we have uh, a ceremony with, that's very easy to run and we have ideally tens of thousands of people getting involved, um, ensuring the security of, of all of this, making sure that those candles stay lit. So a lot of this came to the design decisions of the ceremony. Um, it's designed to be quick and easy for e everyone here at, no, no matter what your level of uh, uh, technical skills, there, there is an easy option, which is there's a, a website you can go to, click contribute, and uh, it will walk you through it in about five minutes. Very easy to run on your computer. If you want to write your own implementation, um, the specifications have been kept to an absolute minimum, even at the cost of some efficiency of the setup, just to ensure that it's very easy to do. Um, and then in other ways, we've just tried to keep this ceremony as, as minimal as possible. There's also the idea of the ceremony is updatable, which will mean something to the cryptographers. But for us is that in uh, 10 years or so, when our communities progress, when hopefully I'm less relevant to the protocol because we're less capturable and we've grown further um, and we've ad adopted many more people that we can add to the previous ceremony, build upon it um, to update it such that we'll have even more people uh, keeping those candles alight. So how does it work? This sounds like some big scary math, but uh, in reality it's not. So the idea is that each individual generates a secret and they mix in their secrets with everyone else. So in this example, the first person mixes in the number three into like the overall secret. The second person adds the number five to the secret and then the third person multiplies the number two in. So the idea is that this, this brown colored 30 is the mix of all the colors slash all the uh, secrets from the various people that came before and that uh, it represents all of these these, these secrets, and these people generated these numbers randomly. But there's a problem with this, and that's that as it stands here, anyone can read this, right? It's just the number 30, that's not a great secret. So we need to encrypt these, and we encrypt these 
by um, quote unquote hiding them in the exponent, we turn them into elliptic curve points. Um, this allows us to still perform the math that I was saying. It is quite literally multiplication, um, but it is done in this, uh, in this encrypted form so that no one can read the overall secret. There's one other thing, and that's that we have the role of the sequencer. The sequencer's job is to do two things. One is to decide who's going next. There are thousands of people who want to participate. How do we decide who's the next, the next contributor? Um, and the sequencer basically uh, holds the files, and when, there's, uh, when someone asks for it and it's, uh, they're available, they'll pass over the files to the next person to contribute. The second thing they do is they verify these contributions. So um, we need to be sure that these contributions that people give back to the sequencer, um, someone hasn't tried to delete some of the points or try to do some weird crazy math that breaks it. So the sequencer just double checks that the files that they're getting back are still valid files so that the ceremony can keep progressing. This sounds like the sequencer has incredible amounts of power. This is not true. So the sequencer's abilities are basically the only thing they can do is censor things. They could lie and say that the file you gave them was corrupt or invalid. Um, they could also just not give you a turn. So you would log in with your Ethereum account and then they'd be like, oh no, sorry, your Ethereum account's not valid. Um, it, or we've got certain validity conditions, it doesn't meet those. Um, in this case, we have signatures which hold the sequencer accountable for this role. So should they try to do these kinds of things, uh, we'll have a proof that we can publicize to show that this is happening and we can decide how to progress from then. Um, so realistically, the sequencer doesn't have any weird and funny powers. Um, it is just a server that runs um, a very simple algorithm, just verifies things and passes them on. Um, in the end, it'll be up to the community to verify that the sequencer did their job correctly. So there's a transcript file that will be spit out of the ceremony at the end which contains the secret, this final secret, and we can verify that what the sequencer did along the way was correct and valid. I kind of lied a little bit earlier when I said that's how it works. There's a little bit more complexity. So how does it really work here? You might have heard of something called the powers of tau. These are the powers. So it's not actually a single secret. We store multiple copies of the secret. We store the secret, the secret's a number by the way. We store the secret, the secret squared, cubed, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to the secret to the power of two to the 12, all as these encrypted points. Then when it's your turn to contribute, the sequencer will pass you this, this file and um, you will come up with a secret, with, obviously with the help of your computer, right? And you do some, some computations, so you also calculate your own personal local secret or entropy you calculate the powers of this, and you do basic multiplication. So you multiply the, the, the corresponding power with the, uh, the, the corresponding elliptic curve point given to you from the sequencer. And by the, uh, the linear properties of um, elliptic curve uh, multiplication, we end up with this final thing, which is basically showing that now your secret has been incorporated into this overall secret, and you can now pass this on to the next person. That you then take this uh, powers and hand it back to the sequencer who verifies that what you did was correct, what you did was valid, um, and that you haven't tried to, to, to cheat the system. So when can you participate? Um, the, we should be uh, launching a testnet very shortly, ideally in the next few days. Um, they. Uh, we're fairly certain that most of the cryptography is uh, on lock. We've, that, that's pretty reasonable. We've already had a first audit on that. But there are a bunch of UX bugs that we need to sort out, and we're handling that. Um, and that's a part of the test net, is to get people to participate and uh, help make this the, I, the, the best uh, process it could be. Um, we've got a final audit launching um, early November, which we'll hopefully be concluding um, after that. Should anything arise in that audit, we'll, we'll uh, squash those bugs, review that, and then hopefully launch the ceremony by the end of November. Um, EIP 4844, uh, I'm sure lots of people have heard discussions as to when that's going to be. Um, ultimately, it's up to the client devs and the community demand uh, for when this gets shipped. But as this is a prerequisite, we'll basically be running the ceremony up to, until that point, um, which is a minimum of two months, 
um, but obviously will run longer should it take longer to get to uh, EIP 4844. There are grants. Um, I'm sure many of you have hold, heard never to roll your own crypto. I'm trying to tell you you should roll your own crypto. Um, all that's needed to, uh, to implement this like from scratch is to do elliptic curve multiplication. Um, Maybe some of you have heard of this or like had it explained to you on a whiteboard. It really is a like, relatively simple thing to do. You have quite a lot of time to do this participation. So if you are going to write your own implementation, uh, you don't, it doesn't need to be super optimized. You don't need to read all the latest papers. Um, so if you've ever wanted to understand what's really going on under the hood of elliptic curves, this would be a great way of doing it. Um, alternatively, you could use uh, an existing client uh, sorry, an existing uh, elliptic curve library, and on top of that, um, you could just implement the client side of things, like the secret generation, um, how you how you sampling that randomness, and uh, how that gets uh, passed on to this uh, elliptic curve library. And then the second category of grants is for crazy randomness generation and contribution. So, if you'd like to go on some weird vision trip that somehow is going to bring out the, the, the secret that you can prove to other people has been done in an interesting way, um, or you want to uh, use your ant, local ant farm to like, measure the location of ants or something weird to sample randomness, something that is very hard to bias, such you can convince other people that uh, your contribution was valid, that you generated randomness in a novel and interesting way. Um, functionally, uh, these are less important because your computer should do this randomness for you. We all rely on our computer's ability to generate randomness already for all of the encryption and cryptography uh, used within this ecosystem and like the wider web. But uh, it's even more interesting and we can ha make even more assurances if you start doing things like this. And then finally, as I'm sure some people have seen from past ceremonies, you can destroy the, destroy the hardware used to generate the secret. What's a little bit different from our ceremony is that the secret only exists in the RAM of your computer for a few seconds, 30, 40 seconds or so. So it's not some, something that gets stored to disk that you need to um, get rid of later or something like that. So destroying your computer is much less necessary. But should this be something you want to do or should you think that you can convince more people that this is secure by doing it, um, reach out to, to myself or Trent and uh, we can and you should be able to see a bit of shouting about this on Twitter about what are good places for grants. And I think those are the, the major points I wanted to top on. So uh, are there any questions? Why two to the power 12? Ah, um, <laughs> we actually have several ceremonies. So um, where the, uh, the ceremony is consist consists of four sub-ceremonies, 2 to the power of 12, 13, 14, and 15, which are basically all the sizes of data blobs we could see ever needing for dunk sharding. Um, so uh, 2 to the power of 12 basically gives us one megabyte um, blocks in expectation uh, that could grow up to two megabytes, but basically that's, um, which we think is a reasonable target and should be fine with current technology, but we give ourselves the ability to scale um, what's that, uh, 16 times over that should we need more growth in the future and if we need anything beyond that uh, we'll rerun the setup. Um, there's also an optimization we made which is pretty fun and interesting which is where instead of having one large setup and then using subsections we can instead do several smaller setups um, and then we can skip the low degree proofs because these setups are disjoint so you don't have more powers should you need them but that, like the low degree is enforced by running out of points. That sounds like the mic's live. Hello. Uh, if I stand correct, uh, if I understand correctly, then um, everyone um, uh, who's um, participating in a ceremony could have like the chance to um, uh, see what the current secret is. So, is there a chance that if you be the last one um, picked in the sequence, then you would have a higher chance to um, kind of ruin the whole process? Um, so not really, and that's because we don't operate over the secret in plain text. We operate over the secret encoded as an elliptic curve point. So it's not, we don't use, it, in my example where the secret was 30, we don't actually use 30. 
we use uh, 30 times the generator of the curve, so it's some elliptic curve point, uh, which means when I give you the powers, I actually hand you this elliptic curve point, which means you can't see into what the secret is. So if you have something you build on top of there, it, it's useless to you, it just looks like a random elliptic curve point, which is the same security assumption we depend on for the rest of Ethereum's signatures, um, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Sure. Hello, okay. Um, you mentioned the quantum vulnerability. Yes. Uh, what is the mitigation for that, and also BLS signature aggregation, and when is that gonna be a problem? <laughs> when it's going to be a problem, I wish I knew. I think there's a lot of money we'd be able to answer that question. <laughs> um, so uh, if we want to switch away from this to uh, less quantum vulnerable things, we would have to switch to um, probably hash-based commitments, uh, Merkle trees. The issue about it being um, uh, not verifiable easily inside of snarks would go away because snarks would also be broken. Um, so like depending on like what your commitment schemes are, you would have to tailor all of that, but we'd have to see quite a big re-architecting of this entire system. Um, so it's not something we have a, like a built-in backup like we do for many of the, the other seams. Um, in answer to your BLS aggregation or whatever question, for the signatures we're using for Ethereum right now, um, under the hood for your private keys, there's also a um, Lamport key pair, uh, like Lamport signature key pair. Um, so we can always revert to that to execute a one-time transfer should that need to happen. So there's uh, more, uh, there, there's resi resilience built into that already. And you don't think it's going to be within the next 10 years that, that quantum will happen then? I don't think so, or at least not at the rate where all of a sudden we're going to have to throw everything away. Um, the good news is we probably won't need a trusted setup in the case that quantum is broken, so we should just be able to switch out the commitment scheme we're using. Um, but yeah, I, I don't see it happening in the next 10 years. If it does, I don't think it'll happen overnight. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering how, like on a, on a test net, do you, what kind of tooling are you using to like execute these adversarial conditions? So the thing with a, do you mean adversarial against the sequencer or against the like setup in general? Uh, so like if on a test net, you wanted to actually like uh, have one of them like hide a secret or like um, not make something available. Like how easy it is to how easy is it to do that on these like live test nets? So the thing here is that um, there there's basically just one validity condition. I can sort of okay, I'm already on the next person's slides. Never mind, <laughs> click is not working. Um, I just slide on there. There's basically one validity condition or two checks we need to do to um, assert that the, uh, the update has been done correctly. So it's not that like there's a weird subset of collusion or something that can break things. It's that have we built the sequencer in a way that such that it can't be dosed or crashed, um, which we can use fairly standard testing infrastructure for. Um, and uh, when you're submitting these these files, we can like try corrupt them and that kind of thing. But that's going to be rejected immediately by the sequencer. Uh, so it's a bit different from standard test nets that we see from blockchain networks because the adversary looks very different. It's more of a Web2 adversary in attacking the sequencer directly uh, than would, would happen otherwise. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Sure. Thanks very much for this. For smaller projects, would you still trust, if, the, if we're talking about a separate project, would you still trust the trusted setup or would you think about different strategies, talks, or anything else? Tr trusting this setup or their own setup? No, if you would work on a project a ZK project now that is kind of thinking, should we do trusted setup? Should we go with stock or with something else? It's hard to know. I think a lot of that comes down to the execution. Um, things like how many participants have you, have you had uh, come on board or uh, how many different implementations do you have? Uh, we already have a few floating around. Um, I think we could get something like 10 or 12 different implementations, these kinds of things. Um, the good news is that once this is up, there's now more infrastructure for smaller projects to leverage in terms of um, like just extending these powers. That would be great. Um, but it, like in, intrinsically, the, it's like very much a case-to-case -case based thing. Um, I, I, I don't think trusted setups in general are safe. I think there are ways of executing that, them that are safe. Um, and I think some of these things I touched on are important to do that. Thanks. Um, have you considered starting with an already established setup and basically adding your randomness into it? And if you're not doing this, why not? Uh, yeah, we have. There's been a lot of discussion on that. 
Um, so we're using, the, the setup is done over the BLS 12.3D1 uh, curves, um, which, I mean, there have been setups done before, um, but not that many. Anyway, um, what I was referencing earlier with this optimization where we stopped doing the low degree proofs because we run out of powers, so we don't have to check that a polynomial is of degree less than 2 to the power of 12 because there is no 2 to the power of 12 plus 1 point. We literally run out. Um, this optimization falls away when we use these other trusted setups that exist to the safety of uh, the, the KZG commitments and the way we're using them in 4844. So for us, it breaks things, being able to use it. So while it would be a good base from a, the perspective of not knowing what the secret is, from the security things we care about in uh, our application, it doesn't add anything. Um, and then it's more of like arguing about nothing up our sleeve numbers kind of thing. It's much easier just to start with the generator, which is what we're going to be doing. Oh, yes, it's a sequential process. So, sorry, the question was, do you run it in sequence and how do we handle civil attacks? Uh, so, yes, we do run it in sequence um, because of the way the um, things are encrypted or whatever, it fundamentally has to be, that, like the way the math works out, it fundamentally has to be uh, a sequential process. We can't combine two parallel ones later. Um, our civil uh, processes are twofold. Um, that's that you need to authenticate with sign-in with Ethereum and we check certain properties of your account, so like a fresh account's not going to work, but an account that you've got even, like you've, you've sent one of two transactions uh, should be good enough that, uh, in the past. The alternative to this, should you not want to use sign in with Ethereum because you like only Ethereum adjacent or something like that is GitHub. And there we're verifying that in the past you've had a commit to, uh, on, on some repo. The civil attacks here in the like low orders, like if we have some people contributing five times or so, it doesn't really matter um, because they just mix in five sets of secrets. But if we extend this out, it does start to matter. So if, every, like, if everyone managed to sibil it and everyone was the same person replicated, that would be bad. So we don't need perfect civil prevention, just moderately so. Okay.